We are in uh, the Gospel of Mark, as you've heard read in your hearing. The first two verses of Mark 13. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to them, Do you see these great buildings? There will be left, not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You may be seated. We have determined this is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible, and even those with differing views have the same, um, the same agreement, at least, that it is a difficult text. And so I encourage you to study it further on your own. And though we are, as we said last time, looking at eschatology or apocalyptic-like predictions, that's not the main point of the teaching. As one said, the primary function is to promote faith and obedience in a time of distress. And after a series of ominous warnings of judgment, we find Jesus and his disciples leaving the temple for the last time. And Jesus is here going to be very pastoral. We noted 19 imperatives in this chapter last time, basically saying, how then should we live in light of such horrible news of coming judgment. Be on your guard, do not be led astray, stay awake, watch and pray. However we interpret the text, this is for the church of all ages, verse 37, and what I say to you, the disciples in that day, I say to all. We noted four common views last time, that one, all is fulfilled in the past, that's leading up to the future, literal, visible second coming of Jesus, a view that uh, we reject, that there's no second coming in this text at all, literal. Or the visible second coming must be found elsewhere. We do accept that view. But then another view is mostly fulfilled in the past period, with the latter part being fulfilled in the future. Not all agree as to where to to divide the text as a transitional text with that view. A third view, all to be fulfilled in the future. This is primarily for Israel in the future and not for the church. And then the view I took, a blending of the past and future are intertwined in the passage. There are things that happened leading up to 70 AD with the destruction of the temple, the fall of Jerusalem, uh, that will continue to happen in history until the second coming. There are things in the text that happen then and are prefigurements of what to expect at the second coming when they'll be ultimately fulfilled. Uh, there are things in this text that happen once and will never happen again, like the destruction of the temple itself, but serve as a type, a paradigm of what to expect in a final judgment at the second coming. There's tension, there's paradox. Past events and ongoing historical events are reminders that the Lord is coming again and there will be a final judgment and all along the way the church will meet opposition and distress. And the disciples ask these two questions which Jesus seems to answer in a twofold way. When will these things be, verse 4, the destruction of the temple, and then what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? They thought the destruction of the temple and the end times were concurrent. They thought that the temple coming down would be the end of the age. And so, what will be the sign of all these things being accomplished? And we determined last time that there are two ages, this age and the age to come. The last days have been since the incarnation to the second coming, last time, last hour, all synonymous with the entire gospel age. And we saw that these are the beginning of birth pains, but the end is not yet. And there will be a lot more happening leading up to the end of the age. And so I have an extensive study on eschatology available. I've changed my views a little bit since then. I even almost changed them this morning when the hearing of the word of, uh, read. <laughs> so you know how difficult this text is. 
Our sermon title is Watch and Pray. This is part two. Last week we looked at three things. Jesus predicts the destruction of the scandalous temple. Jesus prepares his disciples for perilous times. Jesus proclaims dominion over dubious or doubtful terms. Our big idea is believers must be prepared for opposition to their faith in every age. So first of all, we note the abomination of desolation. Verse 14, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Mark's editorial comment here, let the reader understand, is perplexing, but at the very least, it says to us, pay attention. To understand a passage like this, we must first and foremost listen to the language of the passage like Mark's audience would have heard it. They were perhaps confused, conflating the destruction of the temple with the inauguration of the age to come, but the language Jesus used meant something particular to them as Jews at that time. And verses 14 through 23 focus is mainly on details regarding the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem, the siege of Jerusalem. And so first we look at desolation, the abomination of or that causes desolation, described by one as an appalling sacrilege. Abomination in the Old Testament is oftentimes referred to as either pagan idol worship practices or Jewish vile abominations committed in the temple. Ezekiel 5.11, they de- you defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations. Matthew makes reference to the abomination spoken of through Daniel the prophet. So that seems to be our reference. Daniel 9.27, 11.31, 12.11. And so the disciples asked what will be the sign, the corrupting of the the temple with an appalling sacrilege, whatever that is, seems at least in part to answer the question he, or in Matthew 24, 15, standing where he ought not to be, the abomination of desolation. He's not where he ought to be. Daniel in his chapter 11 said, Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes it desolate or causes desolation. And so the Jews believed that this was fulfilled by a man named Antiochus Epiphanes during the Maccabean Wars in 168 BC. uh, 40,000 Jews were killed at that time. They invaded the temple, sacrificed a pig, spread the blood on the altar, set up a statue of Zeus in the holy place above the altar. It was an abomination that caused desolation to the temple. To the Jews, this was definitely they thought what Daniel was speaking of. And Jesus refers to that event in Daniel, but he says apparently there's going to be more to this prophecy. That's where I see double fulfillment sometimes or multiple fulfillments of something that is spoken of as a prophecy. We spoke last time of prophecy and historical events having more than one fulfillment, and Jesus is pointing to Daniel's prophecy as though it had reference to them in their day. And we know that Jesus had something contemporary in mind because of all the local uh, warnings for fleeing Judea. And so of several interpretations of the abomination that causes desolation, two of the most common are sacrilegious activities of Jewish zealots who moved into the temple and took over the Holy of Holies and committed murders in the holy place. That was done during This time that Jesus is speaking of, up to and after Jesus' death, I should say. Josephus is contemporary, a Roman Jewish historian, 15 times mentions the zealots committing sacrilege, those who are polluting the sanctuary. He blames them for being men who were ritually defiled, troops who were without previous purification, and some wounded in the war entering the temple and climbed up and standing in the holy place with their blood sprayed all over the place, defiled the the sanctuary. And so it could be, among other things, these Jewish zealots. 
But a second view is that Titus and his Roman armies, which surrounded the city as far as Luke 21.20 says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Perhaps Daniel's references to forces from him, which means a, a, a term that can mean political and military forces, refers to Titus and his troops. Images of Caesar and the Roman eagle were on their banners. Josephus tells us that while the city of Jerusalem was still burning, the soldiers brought their legionary uh, uh, standards into the temple precincts and offered sacrifices there, declaring Titus to be victor. The idolatrous representations of Caesar and the Roman eagle on the standards would have constituted the worst imaginable blasphemy to the Jewish people. This was an abomination that causes desolation in their minds for sure. I tend to think that's what Jesus is referring to. It could be the zealots, but that one makes more sense to me. But then there's tribulation. Beginning in verse 51, let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are pursuing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Now again, we come up with different views of what this is referring to. Is it only 70 A.D., once and done? Is it only future end times? Does it have a double meaning? 70 AD is a prefigurement of a final tribulation and judgment. One has said the catastrophe that befell Jerusalem in the Jewish war of AD 66 to 70 was a prolepsis, a paradigm in history of the woes that would transpire at the end of history before the return of the Son of Man. And so some believe as well, that the paradigm depicts tribulation not only at the end, but also throughout history. And I'll look at that in our application. But let's notice some things about the text. Now, you have to put your thinking hat on today, okay? Let's, we had a loss of an hour, but we got to dig in here for a few minutes. Notice things that seem obviously in the past. Warnings of local references for in those days... Points to verse 15. Warnings restricted to a geographical location. Those who are in Judea. Housetops has to refer to flat roofs typical of Jerusalem and not most of the rest of the world, especially today in the world we live in. Those working in the fields would hang their cloaks on a pole while working and pick it up on their, when they were going home at the end of the day. There are weather warnings, pregnant moms being in a field with your cloak off, not taking time to retrieve it, were all things that they would see happening at that time. We noted last time the false messiahs and religions existed then and throughout history, but they were more prevalent, as I understand it, in that period of time than any other period so far in history. And so he warns them, be on your guard, a reference to the disciples. A warning to flee to the mountains. And according to some historical writings, they say that the, the Christians fled to Pella of Perea. And while these accounts are disputed by some, it's reported that not a single Christian perished in the slaughter of Titus and the fall of Jerusalem. And they attribute that to these particular warnings of Jesus to his disciples. And then we know 70 AD was a great tribulation. The urgency is obvious. Don't come down and enter the house to get your stuff, but flee. 
difficulty for pregnant moms would be in any period of history, but it would be very difficult in an urgent moment, winter, swollen waterways between the city and the hills would swell, making it impossible to cross them to, over to safety into the hills. And then while Christians ran from the city, Jews fled into the city, which Josephus records. Wars described in unimaginable horrors of brutality and famine leading to starvation, dead bodies filling the streets, thousands were crucified, weeping and wailing, says Josephus, was louder than the sounds of war. At the trial of Jesus before Pilate, the Jews said to, to, to him, his blood be upon us and upon our children. You have to wonder if that's what's happening here in 70 A.D., by the prediction of Jesus. Josephus notes that 1.1 million Jews perished. His closing words on the war, and you can read the entire account in his book of wars, it is therefore impossible to go distinctly over every instance of these men's iniquity. I shall therefore speak my mind here at once briefly, that neither did they or did any other city ever suffer such miseries nor did any age ever breed a generation more fruitful in wickedness than this was from the beginning of the world. The wall of the temple was eventually overrun and fire set and the scorching heat eventually brought the temple down, just as Jesus said, stone by stone. Jesus had previously stood over the the city of Jerusalem, and he cried, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, and stones those who are gathered, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and stones those who are gathered, I'm sorry, I'm skipping. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. But then we ask the question, could it also be a paradigm for a final future tribulation, perhaps the little season in Revelation? Reputable scholars see the language in verse 19, such tribulation has, as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be passed, uh, will be again. That's past never to be duplicated. Others see what is called Semitic hyperbole. Hyperbole is an overstatement to prove or make a point, and it's found especially in Jewish writings. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Probably hyperbole. The seriousness of sin, spoken in hyper, hyperbolic terms. Until now and never will be is language that sometimes means really bad, but not necessarily exhaustive. And this language is typical of prophetic sp uh, literature. Exodus 10, 14, the plague of locusts in Egypt sent uh, such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. Joel of the destroying locusts in his days in Israel, equivalent to the day of the Lord, said, Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Joel 2, 2. Concerning Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel said, And because of all your abominations, I will do with you what I have never yet done, and the like of which I will never do again. Ezekiel 5.9. Jeremiah said of the same event, Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. Jeremiah 37. Daniel, for under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what... Which, uh, what has been done against Jerusalem, speaking of the Babylonian event. And you think about it, there have been some pretty devastating tribulations in the past. Was there ever a greater tribulation than the Noahic flood before or since? Only eight people survived 
The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was pretty devastating. 1.1 million Jews were killed in 70 AD. Six million were killed in the Nazi Holocaust. And so the tribulation of 70 AD was devastating. There is no doubt, but its implications were not perhaps exhausted. The desolating abomination originally referred to Antiochus Epiphanes. Jesus brings it up again in a fuller way to be fulfilled in 70 AD. And like all the other things we saw last week, earthquakes and rumors of wars and false religions, it is perhaps a paradigm for even another tribulation in another day. One author refers to 70 AD as rehearsals of the last judgment. In other words, though never to be repeated again, a paradigm or a prefigurement. The second thing we notice is the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 24 and following. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now, here again, we're in a very difficult text. Many with different eschatological views are pretty dogmatic that this speaks of a future coming only. But in those days after that tribulation, appears to be a shift. The but in verse 24, marking a strong contrast and transition from 70 AD judgment to the future second coming, they would say. Some see the clean break at verse 26, will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Some orthodox and reputable commentators believe this coming in the clouds was fulfilled as a symbolic enthronement or final marker that his kingdom had come. They believe in a literal future second coming, but they believe this coming, like Sinclair Ferguson, who most of us would trust, the coming of the Son of Man may refer to his establishing of his kingdom rather than his coming again. And the gathering of the elect is seen as the ongoing gospel mission, the triumphant kingdom gathering the elect until the Lord's return. Well, I won't be dogmatic, but I see it very possibly as a coming, as Ferguson notes, but a paradigm or a prefigurement of the actual second coming. Again, hyperbole with cosmic signs and upheaval, very common by Old Testament prophets of coming judgment, God coming down in judgment. Stars falling out of the sky, sun going dark, moon not shedding its light, mountains melting, valleys splitting open like wax, all kinds of language like that. As one said, typical Jewish imagery for events within the present order that are felt or perceived as cosmic or, as we should say, earth-shattering. The prophets even sometimes speak of the day of the Lord as both a present event and a foreshadowing of the final day of the Lord's coming. So 70 AD could have been a coming using the Semitic hyperbole for Israel's judgment and his enthronement and establishment of his invisible kingdom. He did say in Luke 17, 20, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. But beyond that, it prefigures the future second coming and judgment at the end of the age. We call this the already and the not yet. And we noted last time that the last days began with Christ's resurrection. I should say his incarnation all the way through his resurrection to the present time. It began at his incarnation, the last days end at the end of this age. The likely source of this prediction here is Daniel's vision of Messiah's enthronement. Listen to Daniel 7, 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days, 
and he and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom and all peoples nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed could that have began with his invisible kingdom that does not come with observation it's very very likely there's biblical warrant for seeing this coming as possibly symbolic language of an enthronement that took place at the time of the fall of Jerusalem. And the death knell was sounded against Israel and Judaism, and the king had ascended on high. That 70 AD event was a time where Judaism and Israel's, uh, and all of its past practices of sacrifice were done. Jesus said earlier in Mark 9, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later at the transfiguration probably was too short of a time to fulfill that. I believe Pastor Luke pointed to the resurrection as the likely fulfillment of that, but I would like to extend it from the resurrection to 70 AD and say it's possible that that prediction by Jesus was ultimately fulfilled in 70 AD. At the resurrection, he was declared to be the Son of God in power by the resurrection from the dead. But we know from Hebrews in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready, is ready to vanish away. I believe it vanished away absolutely in 70 AD. You might think otherwise. We noted last time that the last days began, as we said, with the incarnation all the way to the second coming. And one author said, belong uh, uh, is essentially together all of those events, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, second coming, belong essentially together and are in a real sense one event, one divine act. And so all this leading to the end. Meanwhile, 70 AD was a marker. And God is giving an opportunity for mercy and if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. And so the Lord is coming again, not just in victory, but terrible judgment, which will usher in the new heavens and the new earth, and a visible, eternal kingdom. And 70 AD was merely a down payment prefiguring the end of the age. The disciples were told in Acts 1.11, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Meanwhile, the elect are being safely gathered as sheep into the sheepfold. All by God's great mercies. Well, this brings us to our third point. We're saying that the abomination of desolation was fulfilled in 70 AD, but it is a marker of great tribulation that may well come at the end of the age and in some senses all along through history. We're saying that the, the coming in 70 AD in judgment was a coming in hyperbolic terms, but it was a marker for the actual coming in the final day. But then we have, third of all, Jesus gives some final words of warning. I said these things were intertwined and not always easy to sort out. But this is how I see this portion of the, the, of the text. Part of it is for those in that day, verses 28 and following, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is ne near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Is your head spinning yet? 
There are so many interpretations of that text right there, it would take hours. <laughs> Let me see if I can summarize it. For those in 70 AD, verses 28 through 31, that the parable of the fig tree is given simply as an illustration of seeing the indicators for them of what he had said previously to flee Judea. That an abomination of desolation was coming, and this is just an illustration of what I just told you to do. And so it's for those in that day. Verse 29, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near. Is speaking to those disciples as a warning for their day in a parable for the local geographical references he's already given. Luke also adds in his gospel, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near, which seems to support there was in some sense an enthronement of a kingdom, of Jesus in his kingdom in 70 AD. Well, what about this generation? There are so many different interpretations of just that little phrase, taken in several ways, and obviously scholars differ. But to save time, I'm going to distill it down. As I see it, this generation in one, is, in one of its most common meanings in Scripture, is a generation in a temporal sense with a time element. In other words, the same generation of people alive within that time. Just as he said before, some of you will not die before you see me coming in my glory. This generation living at that particular time, he didn't say that generation as some future generation, this generation also, when you see is plural, and it refers to those living at the time Jesus spoke these words. Many of the present generation would be alive in 70 AD when the temple is destroyed, and also the, the, they, they will witness the coming of Christ in, in his enthronement and dominion and the transition of the establishment of the new covenant kingdom. One day heaven and earth will pass away, but I speak on the authority of the, thus saith the Lord. Jesus says, this is a deity passage that maybe you've missed in times past, but Jesus is taking the authority of God here. My words will not pass away. Just as sure as I am speaking, you can depend on what I'm saying to come true. But then there's something here for those in every age until the end, verses 32 through 37. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Verse 32, that day and that hour forms a transition from this day, this generation, to that day, that hour, to, I believe, the literal second coming. There are no signs. Even Jesus and his humanity is limited from date setting. Before they had geographical cultural indicators, they could know and understand. He warned them. But here you do not know when the master of the house will come. There's an obvious transition here. You know, you do not know. And so be on guard, keep awake. Stay awake, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. Stay awake. And so the tension in the passage between the already and the not yet is the church lives in a sense of urgency. We occupy until he comes. We work, we watch, we pray with expectation. There's a tension between this age and the age to come. The world system is against us. Satan is against us. Sin is against us. The political pressures we saw last week are against us. Families will be against you. Culture is against you. 
Natural crises will be taking place. Earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, spiritual opposition. Expect it. You can't change it. There is no utopia this side of heaven. It is the world to come that is our great hope. And so the Hebrew writer says, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Jesus is coming and we'll make it. Verse 37, what I say to you is not restricted to them. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That applies to the collective people in the corporate body, the church or the churches at large through every age of history until the end of the age. One author says the uncertainty of the Lord's return means that men must be spiritually ready to meet the Lord whenever he comes. And for this reason, signs of the last days will be just like the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem. I, I should say should not be. It not given to pinpoint the second coming but as a reminder, Jesus is telling us he's on his throne, he's coming again, and our redemption is nearer than it was the day before. Stay awake. In the next few minutes, let me give you some implications of this text. First of all, unlike the great judgment in the end when flight will not be an option, this is a warning to unbelievers they were warned to run for the hills in this day that we're looking at, but in the end they will cry out for the rocks to fall on their heads rather than face the judge of the universe. There will be nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. Revelation 6, 15 through 17, everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Matthew's account of this same text follows it immediately with three warnings. The parable of the ten virgins, the unprepared virgins bringing, uh, banging on the door, but it's too late, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. The parable of the talents, the faithful servants are rewarded, but he says, cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then finally, Matthew ends, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and separates the sheep from the goats, to those who are without Christ, he says, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If you want to know a greater tribulation than 70 AD, this is the greatest tribulation of all. Eternal damnation, weeping and gnashing of teeth, going away into eternal punishment while the righteous go into eternal life. Don't doubt it. Second Peter chapter 3 says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, and they will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Don't doubt it. Judgment is coming. For believers... We have said it over and over again, watch and pray. Speculations, laziness, apathy, lethargy will not do. Some in Thessalonica did not go to work because they expected the Lord to return. And that has happened throughout the ages, standing on mountaintops, waiting, believing the date has been set, only to be turned into fools. God is sovereign over the times. Verse 32 tells us no one knows the day or the hour, not the angels, even the Son has limited in His humanity, knowing of that exact hour. And in turn, 
We are to be into ceaseless watchfulness. Uncertainty is good for us. Don't be led astray by signs and wonders and false gospels. The devil can do them. The parables of the talents and the pounds tells us to use our gifts faithfully for the Lord's service until he comes. And so if we fail to learn from these words to be prepared and watch and wait and pray and work and stay awake, we've missed the entire point of this passage. Every passage in the Bible seems to me that points to the end time has this same theme. How then shall we live? We are to live, Titus says, in the light of the grace that's been given to us, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then I might say this as I close. Don't be surprised at the ongoing tribulation. Tribulation occurs throughout history. Some of, see tribulation as an ongoing event in this text. G.K. Beale in his book on Revelation, the, re, the tribulation is a present reality. This tribulation is not confined to the days immediately preceding Christ's return, he says, but commences with the birth of the church and continues throughout the church age. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. 2 Timothy 3.1 And so we established last time that the last days is this entire age and what we hope for is not yet at hand. Don't be deceived. Temptation to defect, to lose, resolve. This is not our home. We're just passing through. Don't get too attached to it. Don't be thrown off the track. Don't faint. We'll reap in due time. The Apostle John, exiled to the island of Patmos, Patmos said, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom. And it was because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The tribulation and the kingdom, John, was suffering. To the church in Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Do not fear what you are about to suffer Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The apostle Paul said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The saints in heaven cry out, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And he responds until the last martyr is brought home. And then an elder in heaven says, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There is one sense in which this entire life is a great tribulation. We mentioned that last week. We must be reminded of that time and time again. No wonder Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The apostle went throughout the region, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Beale again says, one cannot exercise kingdom rule except throughout or through tribulation and endurance. Faithful endurance through tribulation is the means by which one reigns in the present with Jesus. But I would remind you that the greatest tribulation was at the cross where Jesus suffered for his people's sins. And that's why we have a promise that we'll make it to the end. Three times in this text, it talks about the elect's preservation. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days to lead astray, if possible, the elect. 
And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. God's chosen people no longer can mean the covenant nation of Israel alone. Jesus is speaking to his disciples then and now, those chosen from eternity past, Jew and Gentile, who now, through the new covenant uh, promise, are the people of God. And since 70 AD, God's agents have been gathering the elect from the ends of the earth. And those days will be shortened, and so they will be preserved by the grace of God through thick and thin. Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. It is a gospel of victory. Even though there is tribulation, the church will prevail. Not one of his sheep will be lost. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. And Jesus promised, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Meanwhile, we are to remember him until he comes. Until we meet him face to face. Meanwhile, we'll meet him in the Lord's table and he will meet with us.